Let me ever so brief, I mean really briefly review the two or three high points of what I said last night, then make some concluding comments and then move on from there. I distinguished between, here's one of the things I did, I distinguished between two understandings of punishment. Punishment, I said, in the nature of the case, is a backward-looking phenomenon. Often confused, it's, it's hard treatment for what someone did in the past. I mentioned that the other reasons for imposing hard treatment, which are forward-looking <coughs> reasons, which expect to, to achieve some sort of good. Um, Okay, so I distinguish two understandings of punishment. One is far and away dominant, and it goes back to the ancient Greeks and Romans. Punishment is retribution. Punishment is paying back, it's redressing injury, it's getting even. And the basic idea is that wrongdoing creates an imbalance. Of the wrongdoer benefits from this interaction and the victim what's the opposite of benefits um, uh, su su suffers <laughs> su suffers from this uh, engagement and the idea of retribution is that you bring it back into balance there's another view of punishment and those of you who are interested in philosophy uh, another view of punishment, which is only about 30, 40 years old, which is the one I favor, in the philosophical literature it's called the expressive theory of punishment. I invented an English word and called it the reprobative theory. Here's the idea, that punishment expresses re disapproval. Punishment is a way of firmly expressing condemnation of what person did. It's not payback, it's, it's a strong expression of condemnation. And I said that one of the clearest examples, and I think sort of non-controversial examples of that, is parental punishment of children. Um, there's got to be something very sick if a parent thinks of punishment as payback as opposed to reproval. I then argued that, so far as I could see, the New Testament, Jesus and the New Testament generally reject retribution, reject payback. I've referred to the reciprocity code, which you find in the ancient Greeks and Romans, and obviously also in the Jews, among the Jews. And Jesus' attitude about the positive side, I said, of the reciprocity code is, well, by and large, it's a good thing to return favors for favors, but don't let it hinder you giving benefits to those who cannot return your benefit. But, but it's, you know, it's by and large a good thing, and Jesus' attitude toward us, you know, is, uh, even Gentiles do it. Even tax collectors do it. Big deal. Jesus' attitude and Paul's attitude towards the negative side of the reciprocity code, answering harm with harm, evil with evil, is flat out rejection. Always return good. Return evil with good. So I just think that that's a rejection of retribution. Um, even though a lot of the Christian tradition has affirmed retribution. What I also suggest to way towards the end is this. Well then we talked about forgiveness. It seems to me, anyway, that full and, com and, and forgiveness, I said, is not counting it against the wrongdoer. In, in your interactions with the wrongdoer, not counting it against him, not holding it against him. It seems to me that full and complete forgiveness of a wrongdoer means foregoing punishment. Punishment, the very essence of punishment is imposition of hard treatment for what somebody did. And that's one mode of holding it against him, obviously, right? That just is one way of holding it against him. There are other ways, being angry and so forth, but punishment just is holding the prior bad deed against him. So I think full and complete forgiveness involves the foregoing 
of punishment and foregoing support punishment. And if that's true, here's a really important conclusion, I think. If full and complete forgiveness is sometimes permissible, and I think Jesus and New Testament clearly suggest it is, if full and complete forgiveness is sometimes anyway permissible, then punishment is not in general obligatory. Sometimes there's the moral option of forgiving instead of punishing. Let me say it again. Then it just follows, it seems to me, that punishment is not in general obligatory. Maybe obligatory in some cases, but it's not in general obligatory. You could put it like this. It's not always true that justice is violated if we forego punishment. It's not always true that justice is violated if we forego punishment. And that has theological implications which on this occasion we pretty much have to uh, refrain from spelling out. So, a few concluding comments. Over the past 40 years or so, probably 50 years by now, a good many states have had to, you know, states, a good many states have had to face up to the issue, how do you make a transition from a situation of deep governmental injustice to some kind of peaceful and just alternative? How do we make a transition from a situation of deep governmental injustice to a reasonably peaceful and just future. And in a good many areas in Latin America, and then most famously, I suppose, in South Africa, truth and reconciliation commissions have been established. Those have invariably proved to be controversial. There are always a number of points of controversy, but the following issue of controversy is always present. There are always some people hold that reconciliation is a great social good, peace, and that the only way to achieve peace is amnesty, pardon, and so forth. There's always another group of people which says, Punish the wrongdoers have to be punished. Justice requires that they be punished. And so, surrounding the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission were swirls of controversy over exactly that. Bishop Tutu favoring forgiveness, amnesty, and so forth, and my friend uh, um, Ellen Busak being dead set against it, saying that justice had to be, and it was just wrong to forget about punishing the wrongdoers. And what those of us who heard Terry sing the other night talk passionately after the movie, what was the movie called, the story? Talk passionately about the situation in Cambodia is how difficult both it is to get out the truth of the matter. And even if you think justice should be rendered to the wrongdoers, how extremely difficult international law is, is proving, how, how incapable international law presently is, is proving to be to, to render justice. So, so there are all kinds of questions there that could be the topic for a whole lecture or seminar and so forth. Let me just conclude like this. We in the United States have more or less the opposite problem. The opposite problem, not of dealing with a situation of how we move from a situation of massive governmental injustice to a situation of relative peace and justice. That's not our problem. The main problem in the US is that we have a criminal justice system that in all kinds of ways treats the prisoners unjustly. That's our main problem. 
And you in Honduras have yet a third sort of problem, a pretty good set of laws, and a judiciary, and judges and prosecutors. You've got, you, you've got, the, you've got the system in place, but the system doesn't work in a vast number of cases to secure justice because of lack of trust all up and down the line. We've heard about this corruption and so forth. I want to close, and this is particularly relevant then to my country, with a quotation from Deuteronomy 25, 2 through 3. And Jill is going to put it up on the screen. If the guilty man deserves to be beaten, to be punished, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes in proportion, to, in proportion of his offense. Forty stripes may be given him, but not more, lest if one should go on to beat him with more stripes than these, your brother be degraded in your sight. The writer of Deuteronomy is clearly assuming that if, if the criminal is punished in private, out of sight of the judge, and I presume out of sight of the public as well, it's all too likely that the wardens are going to impose more than, more than 40 strikes. And then it concludes with this truly moving conclusion. Lest your brother be degraded in your sight. It seems to me that my country's criminal justice system must constantly use that as its lodestar. Under no circumstances must our brothers and sisters in prison be degraded. Of course, every, this not just true for my country, but for every country, lest your brother or your sister be degraded in your sight. Um, in effect, we'll be talking more about that shortly. But I'm going to call off this discussion about the complicated interrelationship of forgiveness, punishment, justice, and so forth at this point. Anybody got questions now? And once again, uh, there's room to raise them. Um, what is it? Thursday morning? Thursday morning. We've got, I think we've got two hours set aside for um, discussion then. Anybody now? Kurt, you. You look as if you're talking with a question. I think you're trying to discourage me, so I wasn't using my hand. I thought you were. So my, my question is, you say punishment is not obligatory, but, but, but then but who decides? So I'm thinking of a case of a young man I know. I, I think this, he participated in his first serious armed robbery and was caught. I think he is, I mean, I, I haven't talked to him all about it, but I think he's incredibly repentant. Like, it was a stupid thing to do, but he did it, he got caught, he's probably going to go to jail for a bunch of years. So, sort of my stance is, you know, he did something stupid and he got caught, uh, I think now you have to pay the price. But, you know, he's got two little girls, he's got a family. So, like, how do you, like, can I decide, you know, yeah, if you can get off, if you're really repentant, if you can get off, I'll help you get off. I'll hire you a good lawyer. Like, who decides if he's really repentant, if he ought to get off, use the system as much as you can to try and get him off, or I tell him he should confess, pay his penalty to society. So, so Kurt is clearly raising the question which is important to raise and discuss. 
Um, if it's if if we're dealing if the state is not involved, but if it's just an interpersonal relation relationship, then it seems to me what I said is fairly fairly simply uh, implemented, right? When the state is involved, Kurt, then it seems to me that, that the business of those other three goods that that <laughs> that hard treatment is often those three goods that hard treatment is is designed to secure come into place. And in this case, the state has a general deterrence system. And the question to raise is whether whether one can whether one can say we won't apply the deterrent system in case people are, are penitent, and one can easily see all the problems involved in that because people will start faking penitence, right? And so it may be the case that, that just for the sake of the impartial imposition of the deterrent system, you should go to jail. But one doesn't think of what's happening then anymore as condemning him because the hard treatment isn't a means of condemnation because he's condemning. He's condemned himself. Um, it's the impartial imposition of a deterrent system that seems to be to be the relevant factor in that case. And it may well be that one's got to say, uh, "Yep, yeah, the deterrent system has to be pretty much impartial in its imposition." So if it was your son, you would say, "I'm sorry," you you know, confess. Go for the lowest, the lowest uh, possible punishment, but you know the system has to work. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to share a case that uh, also speaks to this: that the Pope has the authority or the right of the side. <laughs> yeah, it's a case, but I have a lot of doubts. I was in Guayaquil giving some training to judges, and I was able to observe this firsthand. Peace and Help in Guayaquil had brought a case against a young man. He probably was 19 years old. He was in football uh, for rape of a, of a young lady, 16, about to It was his first offense. He just didn't have a criminal record. And, um, I cannot tell, I mean, I have no idea what was going on in his mind, but of course he was saying he was really sorry that he repented completely. And this was the conflict that the judge had just received my talk on restorative justice, understanding how terrible it is when we send very young people to prison because if they never get fixed, they always get worse. So now this is what she decided. Because he was so young and it was the first time he had raped a girl, According to, I mean, the first time it had been announced, at least. She decided not to prosecute him. And I was really upset. But she had the right to decide. No, the judge did. The judge. <laughs> and it, it felt to me that, yeah, I really don't want this young man to go to prison and ruin his life forever. On the other hand, here we have the rights of the victim. And she decided that in the balance, it was more just to let him go. The, 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 or the, the judge the decided. Mm -hmm. And would love to hear your thoughts on this, because I was really, I mean, I felt terrible about this case. And I, 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 I'm thankful I was not the judge. So it seems, so it seems it seems to me, and this became clear in the South African case, it seems to me that one of the most difficult problems here with Truth and Reconciliation Commissions is exactly the one that you point to there, Nino. The state may decide to forego punishment uh, for the sort of reason that you're talking about, this is a young person and has no prior offenses or whatever, or for the sake of future social peace or whatever. The state more may decide to forego punishment, but the actual victim finds it utterly impossible to forgive. And so the victim feels that she she that she's been victimized a second time. Right? Was victimized in the first case by the rape, and I was victimized a second time by the decision of the of the, of the judge in your case, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the South African case. So there were a lot of poignant examples in South Africa of exactly that of of women saying to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, how can you possibly, 
How can you possibly let this guy go? He murdered my, he murdered my son. Okay. Let's move on. It's about time to descend from the abstract level of theory, where philosophers fly, to the practical, and to reflect on how to go about seeking justice in an unjust world. I say it's almost time for that. <laughs> and I would like to spend most of today and all of tomorrow reflecting on seeking, seeking justice in an unjust world. So far we've been talking about the nature of justice, the nature of forgiveness, the nature of punishment and all of that. But I say it's almost time. <laughs> First, I want to make good on a promise that I made in my third lecture and say something about human rights. I, I think it'd be, you know, just dumb to have these six lectures and not say anything strictly about human rights. So I hope it doesn't take too long, some comments about human rights. Start here. It's been my experience that people often confuse human rights with the rights that human beings have. Let me say it again. That people often confuse human rights with the rights that human beings have. But human rights are only a species of the rights that human beings have. Recall my little story about the student in my course who did a really good job and has a right to an A. He's a human being, <laughs> or she, and so he or she has a right to an A. But that's not a human right. You don't you won't find Joe's right to an A in Nick Waterstore's course listed in any list of human rights. And rightly so. It's a right that a human being has, but it's not a human right. I, you know, the, the terminology is tricky here, and so I can understand why people make the confusion, but I've just discovered that in, when people read my book, a lot of them assume that what I say about human rights is what I want to say about the rights of human beings in general. And when I wrote my book on justice, I first talked about the rights of human beings in general, and then way at the tail end talked about human rights in the hope that people would first get a picture of, of, the, of the fact that the rights, our rights as human beings pervade our human existence and that human rights are a special type. But my attempt to avoid the confusion was a failure and lots of intelligent readers think that in fact the whole book is about human rights. It's not all. There's one chapter about human rights. The rest of it is about the rights of human beings. Okay. So what are human rights? In, chat, in, in lecture three, I talked the rights, about the rights of human beings, okay? I didn't say a word about human rights, other than to say that I would talk about them. <laughs> so today the topic is human rights. I think that the various UN declarations on human rights and the grad their gradual embodiment into international law and jurisprudence, I think that those are a great moral achievement. What Thierry made clear the other night is in the absence of an ad adequate judicial system, um, they, you know, they don't, they don't get applied. But I think as such they are a great moral achievement. And they were a response, of course, to a great moral horror, namely the Second World War. 
So that horror clearly impelled the 1948 initial declaration on human rights. So one way to get hold of the idea of human rights, that's what we're going to talk about, one way to get hold of the idea of human rights would be to read through the UN documents and try to catch the core idea that seems to be operative. The documents don't give a definition of human rights, but one way to get hold of the idea would be to read through them, look at the lists, and sort of say, what's, what's the core, what seems to be the core thought here? That'd be one way to get hold of it. Another way to get hold of the idea of human rights would be to read what philosophers and political theorists, how philosophers and political theorists define human rights. You with me? One way to get hold of it would to be to go through a list of examples, standard UN list, and the other way is to look at what philosophers and political theorists give as their definition. I think initially one would expect those two to yield basically the same results two approaches to the same results. But in fact, they don't yield the same results. The common explanation by philosophers and political theorists of a human right is that a human right is a right one has just by virtue of being a human being. Let me say it again. The common definition You'll find it all over the place in philosophers and political scientists. Human right is a right that one has just by virtue of being a human being. You don't have to be any particular type of human being. You don't have to be a Greek human being. You don't have to be a Honduran human being. You don't have to be a male human being. You don't have to be an intelligent human being. All you got to be is a human being. But when you read through the lists, the UN lists, some of the examples clearly don't fit that definition. Let me give you one example. Article 23 of the original UN Declaration, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 23 says this. You don't have to try to copy it down, you can get the idea. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. Let me read it again. Article 23 of the original UN Declaration on Human Rights. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. Now, to enjoy that right, you've got to be a particular kind of human being, namely one who can work, right? And not every human being can work. Infants cannot. People with Alzheimer's cannot. Paraplegics, lots of people can't work. And so this says concerning a certain kind of human being, those who can work, that they have the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions, and to protection against unemployment. And as I recall, it's Article 25, which says that everybody has a right to a paid annual paid vacation. Now, you've got to be a particular kind of human being to even be capable of enjoying your own having an annual paid vacation. You got to be employed. You can't be an infant. <laughs> I mean, infants don't, aren't candidates for vacations. You can't be sunk into dementia and so forth. So you get the picture. When you actually look at the UN lists, you say, these don't fit the philosopher's definition. They're taking, they're assuming a particular kind of human being. Here's another one, a right to be educated. Some people, and it means formal education, but some people aren't capable of being formally educated, sad to say. 
So here's the question, what's going on? Why do the philosophers and political theorists say that a human right is a right that one has just as human being, not any particular kind of human being? Whereas when you look at the UN lists, you say over and over, hmm, they're assuming a certain kind of human being, one who can work, and then they've got these rights. One who's salaried, and then they've got a right to an annual paid vacation. One who can be educated, and then they've got a right to be educated, and so forth. There's been a lot of discussion about wh why this discrepancy, but I think it's fairly clear why the discrepancy, or at least I, here's my suggestion. I think the UN declarations do not in fact have their eye on all human beings. They have their eye on human beings out of infancy who can function as persons. They have their eye on human beings out of infancy who can function as persons. Some even a bit more narrow than that, but I think all of them. So I think the UN declarations are really declarations, are listing of the rights of, are, are really human person lists, the rights of human persons. Human persons out of infancy. <laughs> Whereas, sad to say, some of our fellow human beings cannot function as persons. They're in dementia. They're tiny infants and they cannot yet function as persons and so forth. So if that's right, we've got these two strategies. You can think of human rights as human person rights, um, out of infancy human person rights, or you can think of them as genuinely the rights of any human being, even those sunk into dementia, those who are still infants and so forth, and one can go either way. Um, we obviously don't have time for that. So I'm going to take the philosopher's definition, no surprise here. Human rights are those which one has just as human being, no matter what kind. Even if you're a paraplegic, even if you're an infant, even if you're sunk into dementia, you're still a human being. And in my view, you still have rights. So that's what I want to talk about. A human right is a right that one has just as a human being. Now once we've identified, oh, well, well the, next, uh, the next important question is then, and what, what accounts for each and every human being having rights? What, what, let me say it again. If human rights are those that each and every human being has just as human being, what, what gives them these rights? Well, where do they come from? What accounts for them? Now I think it's very interesting to note that all of the UN documents are dignity-based documents. All of them say or assume that human rights are grounded in human dignity. Interestingly, they don't say in human autonomy. Remember our earlier discussion? They say in human dignity. And I'm glad that they say that. I think that that's what they ought to say. I think that's the right <laughs> implicit theory. They, let me say it again. All of the UN documents are clearly dignity-based documents. <laughs> but they don't explain the next, they don't answer the next question, and why do we have the relevant dignity? And from stories about the first UN declaration, we know why they're silent on the score. What turned up is that when the original formulators of the UN declaration coming from around the world engaged in discussions about, and why is it that human beings have this dignity, they found they couldn't agree. The Buddhists had one view, the Christians had another, and so forth, the Hindus had another. So here's the decision they made. They decided to affirm dignity, 
and decided to remain silent about why we have dignity, because they couldn't agree. Um, there are some people in the contemporary Muslim community who charge the declarations with secularism on that account. And I think that's not a correct. I, I think the evidence points clearly to the idea was not that these should be secular documents, it's just that they couldn't agree on, on the basis for dignity. Okay. Okay so far? But that is the big question, obviously, and why do we human beings have dignity? Worth, dignity, excellence, goodness, does not just settle on things willy-nilly. There's always some reason why it's a good thing. Um, I don't know. You produce a painting, and we and we all agree that it's good. Samuel, you, you're a painter, and you make a fine painting. So I ask, so we get into a discussion as to what makes it good, and then somebody says, "Oh, there's nothing about it that makes it good. It's just good. Period. It's just that doesn't make any sense. There's got to be there's got to be something about it that makes it a good painting, right?" It may be terribly hard to put it into words. Maybe all we can do is sort of point and say, do you get it? But there's got to be something about it that makes it a good painting. So here's obviously the big challenge for any human rights theorist. And what is it about human beings in general that gives them the dignity that grounds human rights? Okay, that's the big challenge. And what is it about us human beings? It gives to each and every one of us, no matter how impaired we may be, just as human beings, gives us a dignity that grounds our rights to be treated in certain ways. <laughs> now let me first, a parenthesis. A very important parenthesis, I think. One may firmly believe that there are human rights and firmly believe that they're grounded in dignity without being able to answer this grounding question. Let me say it again. One may firmly believe that there are human rights and firmly believe that they are grounded in dignity. But to the question is, and what is it about each and every human being that gives them the dignity? You, one, one says, I don't know. That's a reasonable position. In fact, philosophers find themselves in this kind of position all the time. Let me give another example. A philosopher, a philosopher may firmly believe that there is such a thing as obligation, right? And may spend his or her life trying to figure out what exactly accounts for obligation. And finally throw up his hands and say, you know, I. I don't know, but I still firmly believe that human beings have obligations to each other. So a, so a standard part of philosophy <laughs> is being confronted with phenomena that you try to explain, uh, but that for a long time you can't explain and maybe you die not having provided an explanation or whatever. That's not a very nice situation to be in. It'd be much better if you could give an explanation. But I do think it's important, I, I've had various discussions which make me say that it's important to emphasize the point. It's not irrational to say I do believe in human rights and I do believe that they are based in dignity, but I don't have any good account for the dignity. That's, that may be over the long haul, over the long social haul, unstable. In fact, I think it is. If after 50 years, People saying, I do believe there are human rights, I do believe that they're based in dignity, but I have no idea how to account for it. After a while, one begins to say, hmm, I wonder if one's convictions become a little bit shaky, but it's not irrational. Okay, so now, let me start with secular proposals. 
almost all secular accounts of human rights are dignity based, almost all of them, not quite all. Almost all secular accounts are dignity based. And almost all of them are in turn what I will call capacity accounts of dignity. The idea is that we human beings have certain capacities which are enormously valuable, which give us dignity. And that dignity must not be violated. Capacity accounts. Some capacity, something human beings can do, that we human beings can do, that gives us worth, dignity, a, a truly noble capacity. And that worth must not be violated. Almost all secular accounts are capacity accounts. And there's very little variation in the capacity proposed. The capacity is always this. The capacity to act on reasons instead of out of causes. Let me say it again. The capacity for rational agency, the capacity to act for reasons instead of just out of causes, the way earthworms do. Sometimes you get a refinement, the capacity act to act because you think you ought to. That's a special kind of reason. The capacity to act because you judge something good. That's a special kind of reason. But the general view is this. It's, it's our capacity for acting on reasons, or maybe a special kind of reason, instead of just out of causes. That is a truly remarkable capacity. It gives us dignity, and that dignity should not be violated. Now, I think that this is a truly remarkable capacity that we human beings have. And we, of course, being human beings, are so familiar with it that we don't stand back and, and think about how remarkable it is. Look, most of what happens in this cosmos of ours happens in accord with causal laws. Stones don't roll where they do because they've got a good reason for rolling there or because they think they ought to. Earthworms don't come out of the ground because they've got good reasons for doing so or because they think they ought to. It's not clear that even dolphins, I mean, I think it's clear that dolph dolphins don't have a sense of obligation. I'm not even sure that they act for because they because they've got good reasons. There's a truly remarkable capacity that God has given us human beings. Okay? The ability to judge something good and to pursue it on that account the ability to judge something obligatory and to pursue it on that account. So I think this is a truly remarkable capacity. And if we weren't also familiar with it, as I say, we would stand back and say, this is astonishing. But here's the problem. Some human beings don't have that capacity. Infants do not yet have it. Those sunk into dimension no longer have it. Those in a permanent coma do not have it. And some human beings who are severely impaired from birth don't have it, a, a coma, a permanent state of unconsciousness. So you'll find in the literature various attempts by secular writers to introduce some kind of qualification or whatever. We, we don't have time to get into all of that. In my books I write about it. I think here, I think this conclusion would pretty much be accepted. Capacity accounts do not work. 
I mean, you can choose some other capacity than rational agency, but you're going to have the same problem. People in dementia won't have, name the capacity, people in dementia won't have it. Right? So it doesn't much matter on which capacity you pick. Here's the conclusion, I think. Capacity accounts don't work. <coughs> Virtually all secular accounts are capacity accounts. So a thesis in my book on justice that has annoyed a fair number of readers is this one. I do not think there is any adequate secular grounding of human rights. No secular grounding of the dignity we have that supposedly grounds human rights. As I say, um, secular readers of my book have been usually very offended by that. <laughs> but but I've, I've said to um, I've said to some of them who've corresponded with me, well, fine, uh, give me, you know, give me such an account, then give me an adequate secular account, and none of them has has done that. So, um, okay, I don't think there is an adequate secular account of human rights. That doesn't mean that a secularist has to give up on human rights. Remember my earlier comments that you might firmly believe there are human rights and still not say, I don't know how to account for it. That, that's it's an intelligent, reasonable position. My friend Jeff Stout in the religion department at Princeton University. Jeff is a secularist. He grew up in the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, and so I say to him that he's, a, he's the finest atheist, atheistic member of the Reformed tradition that I know. Um, he, really, he really thinks in many ways in along the lines of the Reformed tradition, but he's an atheistic member of it. So Jeff is annoyed by this conclusion in my book. So I say to Jeff, Jeff, I'm wide open to your providing an account. And he tries a few things. Uh, and I shoot him down. And, uh, <laughs> okay. So what can you and I as Christians say about the grounding of human rights? Almost all Christians who have thought or written about the matter appeal immediately to the image of God. Right? Imago Dei. That is by virtue of the dignity we have as bearing the image of God that we have human rights. Bearing the image of God gives us dignity and it's that dignity that grounds human rights. You find lots of Christian writers just Right, right away giving, with, with no further thought, giving that account, right? To know whether that suggestion works, we have to know what image of God is, <laughs> right? And the history of Christian thought contains an astounding variety of proposals. I think the right word is astounding. That's, that's mostly because the references to image of God in Scripture are so few, so scanty, two or three, and so brief that we've got no option but <laughs> but to speculate as to what's what's meant. To the best of my knowledge, all Christian attempts to explain image of God fall into one or the other of two types. Some of them point to capacities that we have for knowledge of God, for worship of God, for moral action, whatever. A whole group of image of God explanations point to capacities. We image God because we have certain capacities. Another group, the other group, says that we image God by virtue of a certain role in creation. A, a certain role that we have in creation resembles God's role. And to put it briefly, the role of dominion. We have dominion 
God gives us the role, function, whatever you want to call it, of dominion. And that resembles God's role of dominion. If you're going to, if we human beings are going to fulfill that role in creation, dominion, representing God, if we're going to fulfill that role, we need certain capacities, right? I mean, <laughs> if you can't do anything, then you cannot fulfill that God-given role. You cannot resemble God. So it all comes down to capacities. But the point I made about the secularist account is that some human beings, sadly, really don't have any capacities. They have sunken to, I repeat myself, they have sunken to dementia. They have been severely impaired from birth. They're tiny infants. They're in permanent state of unconsciousness, a permanent coma. They can't exercise dominion. They can't act righteously. So my conclusion is that what grounds human rights is God's love for each and every human being. Not image of God, that gets into the capacity problems. What grounds human rights, what grounds the dignity that we have, which in turn accounts for human rights, is this, that God desires fellowship or friendship with each and every human being. Here's an analogy. Imagine a good king, a really good king or queen, a king, who bestows on all his subjects the great good of a fine of a just political order. Okay? Everybody enjoys the good of a, everybody in the monarchy enjoys the good of a just political order. But the king is rather lonely. So he decides to choose some subjects as those with whom he'd like to be friends. Okay? chooses some as those with whom he'd like to be friends. This, I submit, is an honor for the ones chosen. They say, I am honored that you would choose me to be your friend. To be chosen by the monarch is an honor. Most of you know here what a curriculum vitae is. under their curriculum vitae, in their curriculum vitae, in the section called honors, they will cite this. Chosen by the king as one of his friends. <laughs> That'll be in their curriculum vitae. So to be honored in that way is to have worth bestowed on one. You can now be snubbed in new ways, demeaned in new ways. Big deal, you know, so the king wants you to be his friend, so what? Um, that's to be demeaned. I think the application of the analogy is pretty obvious. Suppose that one is a creature chosen by God as someone with whom God desires to be a friend. That's to be honored by God. And to be honored by God is to have worth bestowed on one. And now that every human being has that worth, God wants to be friends with every human being. Okay, the last question to consider is this. Was it purely whimsical on God's part to choose human beings as those with whom he wanted to be friends? 
It was more or less whimsical on the part of the king who he chose in the realm to be friends. The king didn't choose the finest people. The, the king you know, just chose those in whom there was some important potential for friendship. Was it whimsical of God to choose human beings? Might God just as well have chosen crocodiles? Mosquitoes, crocodiles. The answer is no. Crocodiles don't have the potential for being friends with God. Because it's, it's not in the nature of crocodiles to be persons. It's in the nature of human beings to be persons. It may be impaired, that's what I've been saying. It may have sunk in two dimensions. Still, you've got that human nature. And that's what God, God sees in human beings, and not in crocodiles, the potential for friendship. Once, once the moral blockages have been removed, and once in this life or the life to come, we've been healed of impairments, like dementia and so forth. So I think that's what for Christians, and for Jews, and probably Muslims, grounds human rights, grounds the dignity that grounds human rights. God loves each and every human being, one, in this sense, wants each and every one for a friend, and will work to overcome the moral blockages and the physical, psychological blockages that currently prevent that. So my view is that Christians and Jews and Muslims have a way of accounting for human rights that secularists do not have. Okay, that's human rights. It took longer than I thought. What's that? 10. Okay. Now, do we want the air conditioning back on? <laughs> yeah? Kurt is saying yes, and his voice carries weight. Okay, so we've got a bit more than a half an hour. Now I want to move on to my last topic, seeking justice in an unjust world. First, to talk about the role of the state in seeking justice. In Romans 13, 4 and 5, Paul tells us that government is a servant of God. The Greek word for servant is diakonos, deacon. Paul says that government is a servant of God with the God-assigned task of exercising government for the purpose exercising governance for the purpose, he says, of executing wrath or anger on wrongdoers, executing, exercising, executing, exercising wrath or anger on wrongdoers, and thereby giving support to those who do good. God appoints government to do something, and what God, government appoints, what God appoints government to do is to exercise anger, wrath on wrongdoers, and thereby perforce to indicate support of doing good. Notice this. Paul does not say that it's the business of government to exercise vengeance. Paul does not say that it's the business of government to exercise vengeance. 
to exercise retribution. Paul does not say that it's the business of government to exercise retribution. He does not say that it's the business of government to pay back. A lot of Christians have read Romans as saying exactly that, that government is authorized to exercise retribution. Paul does not say that. At the end of Romans 12, Paul says that we are to return good for evil. And Paul says that paying back is to be left to God. Vengeance is to be left to God. Whatever vengeance or retribution there is to be in the, in the world is to be left to God. A lot of Christians have read then Romans 13 is saying, ah, but the state in God's name is allowed to exercise retribution. I put it to you to those who can read Greek. Paul does not say in Romans 13 that it's the business of the state to exercise retribution. He never uses the word payback or repay. He doesn't say that the business of the state is to return evil for evil or harm for harm. What he says is that it's to express, whatever, execute, express, anger or anger at wrongdoing. Now this sounds profoundly anachronistic, but to my ear what Paul is doing here is expressing the recent expressive theory of punishment, or my reprobative theory, which says that the function of punishment is to express condemnation. Not payback, but condemnation. Now, I hardly want to say, you know, that, well, I don't exactly want to say that Paul anticipated what I, Nick Waltersdorf, was going to say in 2012, but, um, <laughs> but, but it seems to me, look, if you've got these two theories of, of punishment in front of you, the retributive and the reprobative or expressive, and then you read Paul in Romans 13, and then you're asked the question, which does Paul's language favor? Anybody's going to say Paul's language here favors the expressive or probative theory, not the retributive theory. Okay. Now I think that when you read when you read Paul on, on the on the benefits to be achieved by the state doing what it's assigned by God to do, namely expressing anger or disapproval or condemnation of wrongdoing. When you look at the goods there that Paul cites, it becomes clear that we interpret him in much too pinched and literalistic a fashion if we interpret Paul as saying that the only function of government is punishment. I think Paul's thought is this. The function of the state is not just to punish wrongdoing, it's also to deter wrongdoing. You know, do what it can to prevent it. And to protect the public from its occurrence. So I think the right way to read Romans 13 is this. It's the God-assigned task of government to curb injustice and to seek justice in society. Yeah, Randy? Just real quick, that's where, that's where in that concept that the, that you were, you're doing this corrective or expressive form of justice in order to promote the common good. Yes, or, or especially this particular part of the common good, to to curb injustice and to seek justice. There may be forms of the common good that go beyond that, like building highways or a Federal Reserve I'm Bank or... With regard to justice, yeah. yeah. So let me say it again. I think that the, what Paul is saying here is that it's the God-assigned task of government to, to curb injustice and seek justice in society. And justice, and, and how does how does government do that? It does it, it does it as follows. It publishes a law code. 
does it by performing four actions. First, it publishes a law code which specifies what may not be done and sanctions attached to violating the law, so a law code. Secondly, it establishes a judiciary to determine when somebody has violated the code and to order punishment in case somebody has. Third, government sets up a police force to, pre to prevent or deter violations of the law code. And fourth, it sets up a military to protect against foreign wrongdoing. Sets up a law code with sanctions, establishes a judiciary to determine when the code has been violated, and, and determine punishment in case it has been violated. The third, a police force to investigate, to deter, to protect violations of the law code, and then a military. I think it's this comprehensive fourfold system that brings about the goods that Paul talks about of expressing anger against wrongdoers and making those who are contemplating doing wrong fearful. Paul says that fearful of doing wrong and, and gives support to the good doers. Now, if God commissions government, government to do that, that fourfold system for deterring wrongdoing and deterring injustice and securing justice, if God commissions government to perform that fourfold task, then, obviously, God does not allow government itself to become an instrument of injustice. Paul doesn't actually say that in Romans 13, but an utterly obvious implication is this. If it's the God-given task of government to secure justice in society, then obviously it's not permissible by God for government itself to become an agent of injustice. What sense would it make? <laughs> I mean, I hardly have to argue the case, right? What sense would it make for God to authorize government to secure justice in society and allow government itself to be unjust. So the obvious implication is that government itself must be just. So let's run through the four principles. The laws must be just. Not any old laws, but the laws must be just. The judiciary must act justly. Not any old way, but justly. The police must act justly, not any old way, but justly. And the use of military force must be just. Sort of obvious implications. So notice the centrality of law in my way of sort of elaborating what Paul says. I, I put it like this. Establish a law code with sanctions, a judiciary to interpret the code uh, and uh, decide when somebody has violated the code and to impose punishments if necessary. A police force to do what it can to deter violations of the code, to investigate violations and so forth, and then a military to protect the people the centrality of law. Here's, I think, a question, an interesting question. Was the centrality of law in Paul's thinking an innovation on his part? And I think the answer to that question has to be no. Paul is here reflecting the Old Testament heritage. Fundamental in how the Old Testament thinks of governance is law. You see what I'm saying? Not just the will of the monarch, but law, just laws, just judiciary, just police, and so forth. 
here's a passage in Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah is thundering. Isaiah is thundering against those, and I'm going to read, who make iniquitous decrees, that is laws, who make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes, to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, making widows their spoil and the fatherless their prey. So do you see what's going on there? Those who make, an, he's thundering against those who make iniquitous laws or decrees, who write oppressive statutes, and then we get what I call the vulnerable coming in. To turn aside the needy from, for, from justice, rob the poor of my people of their right, making widows their spoil, the fatherless their prey. So there we have the widows, the orphans, and the poor. We don't have the sojourners or, or the aliens in this case. Oh yeah, this is Isaiah 10 verses 1 through 2. And now I want to move on last for today to the what you might call the social justice counterpart of God's mandate to government. So far I've ever so briefly talked about what God commissions government to do, curb injustice, secure justice in society, which presupposes just laws and all of that. Now the sort of social justice counterpart. Here's a striking feature of that passage from Isaiah. I think it's a striking feature. Those who make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes and so forth. Um, Isaiah doesn't mention any particular statutes. He doesn't mention any particular laws. And he doesn't mention any particular bad legislators or rulers. There are no proper names here. The prophets were not afraid of pointing the finger at individuals when they thought that was appropriate. Nathan points his finger at David. So they're not afraid to point their finger at particular people. But the target of Isaiah's attack in this passage and almost all other passages in Isaiah It's not specific episodes of injustice. It's not specific wrongdoers. There are hardly any proper names. The target of attack is instead the laws and the social practices. Whose effect is to turn aside widows, orphans, and the poor from justice. I'm going to read you one more example from Isaiah. This is perhaps the, among the most bite, biting and caustic of all examples. Once again, it's practices, laws that Isaiah is going to thunder against, and he's not going to, he's not going to mention anybody's name. No proper names in this passage. Here it is. It's about as biting as, <laughs> as the prophets ever become. The Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing as they go, tinkling with their feet, the Lord will smite them with a scab, the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. He continues, In that day the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the amulets, the signet rings, the nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks, the handbags, the garments of gauze, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Do you get it? Get it? 
all that, turn aside. Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness, and instead of a girdle, a robe. Instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. Instead of beauty, shame, your men shall fall by the sword, and your mighty men in battle. That is as accusatory as anything ever gets. But there are no proper names. <laughs> he doesn't mention any particular person. So it's practices, social practices that he's attacking. So I think that, let me then make this generalization. I think that in these prophetic denunciations of injustice, we recognize a, a particular feature, we recognize a characteristic of social injustice, of that particular form of injustice which is social injustice. Social injustice is injustice reaped by laws and public social practices. Let me say it again. Social injustice, as opposed to episodes, is injustice reaped by the laws and by the social practices. And I submit that what the prophets almost always have their eye on. In a few cases, it's Nathan to a particular human being, but usually what they've got their eye on is some social practice in Israel or the surrounding nations, some laws in Israel or the surrounding nations, and that's the target of their attack. I think that's social injustice, and that the prophets are the first great, what do you want, what, what do you want to say, the first great examples we have of identification of social injustice and attacks on it. Going, going beyond specific accusations and identifying. So, so, so I'm going to say that. I think that to recognize social injustice, you have to be able to look beyond particular episodes and particular victims and wrongdoers. You have to be able to look beyond the particulars to recognize a certain pattern. And then you ask what accounts for that pattern. And what the prophets say, what accounts for that pattern are certain practices and laws. That's why people are doing these things certain practices that they've fallen into, certain laws that have been passed. <coughs> so to identify social injustice requires a certain ability of abstraction. You see what I mean? Backing away from the particulars and identifying generalities and then identifying causes of the generalities. And often what happens, this came up before, often what happens is that when you, say, when you say to somebody that they then are a participant in one of these unjust social practices or, or whatever, the person will respond by saying, but my, but my intentions are clean and pure. But the prophet isn't accusing any particular people of bad intentions. I'm sure he thought that there were a lot of bad intentions around. He's saying it's these it's these patterns of, of corrupt laws and corrupt practices. So to speak up for social justice and to speak against social injustice requires, requires that one be able to identify the practices and the laws that are creating these patterns of unjust behavior. And that's what the prophets do. And of course, the prophets assume that things can be different and that they should be different. I say that because in quite a bit of sociological literature, you will find writers saying that it was not until the modern world that people realized that social practices could be different. I think that's nonsense. The Israelite, prof the Israelite prophets. <laughs> are starkly aware of the fact that things can be different from that things should be different. I'm 
I move towards conclusion. The Hebrew prophets don't say very much about how to get from here to there. How to get from their present situation of social injustice to a situation of justice. They don't pinpoint the laws that should be changed. They don't mention the political activities that might secure the change. Let's face it, the Hebrew prophets don't provide much help to social activists. They don't give you guidelines. And my guess is that a lot of the old Israelites were angry at the prophets on exactly that account. Sure, you're constantly squawking about what's wrong, but you never tell us how to, how to improve it. If you're so smart and think you know everything that's wrong about America, why don't you get down in the trenches and change it? Instead of just lobbing grenades over the wall. I think of it like this. The prophet does what needs, what has to be done first. The prophet tries to open people's eyes. Before you can change things, you have to open people's eyes. The prophet tries to open the eyes of the powerful to see the injustices that they are perpetrating. He tries to unstop their ears so that they hear the cries of the afflicted. He tries to soften their hardened hearts. That's what he does. And of course, let me add that what he does is he exercises social imagination. He imagines a society in which things are different. And so some of the most lyrically visionary social passages in all of Western literature are from the Hebrew prophets, in which the prophet imagines a day when things are different. Isaiah, from Isaiah, imagine a, imagines a day when the bonds of wickedness are loosed and the thongs of the yoke are undone, when the oppressed are let free and every yoke is broken. When people share their bread with the hungry, take the homeless poor into their houses, clothe the naked, and do not avert their eyes from their own relatives. Social imagination. So let me close with this. Opposition to social injustice will not always take the form of the prophets. It won't always be so harshly accusatory. Depends on your audience. Sometimes it may be more winsome. Usually the prophets are not very winsome, they're accusatory. Opposition to social justice may sometimes be more reasonable, more less accusatory, and so forth. And often it will take the form of suggesting ways to change, go beyond just opening eyes and unstopping ears and unhardening hearts. But always a movement for social justice has to wake people up to what's happening. Has to wake people up to what's happening. And once that is awakening has occurred, then there's space for organizations like HAS and International IJM to get down into the trenches and work at Making, at making the changes. Um, so what I've suggested is we glean two things from Scripture as to how to seek justice in an unjust world. One, the centrality of government. The centrality of government in this. And the centrality in turn of law just law, just uh, de decisions, and so forth. And secondly, that's got to be combined with civic movements and civic society for social justice. Is, is, that's got to be combined with, uh, combined with the prophetic voice, opening people up 
to what's happening. In my, in my country, opening people up to what's in fact happening in our prisons. Most Americans don't know and probably don't want to know what's happening in the prisons. I think it's a good thing that these guys, mostly guys, are behind bars. So those two, in combination, are indispensable to government, good government, and government will still always be defective, social practices will be bad, and the prophetic voice, which awakens people to what's happening. And then the third thing, actual organizations like AGS and IJM to sort of move us from the one to the other. Um, five, ten minutes? Yeah, Robert? Yeah, ten minutes. I have a question about uh, deterrence. Yes, so the state also has within its purview to deter crime. To what? To deter crime, deterrence. You also said that that's one of the important... Uh, so it's especially, especially the police force. Right, there's a, well, yes, and, and certain laws. But and certain laws. It yeah. appears to me that often that is a white card that uh, states have to simply impose um, unjust punishments for the people. Uh, I mean, well, what are, are the boundaries of the How far can you go? Because it's even you know, with the uh, capital punishment in the United States, people often say that you can the term. So the, so the next question of application of this theoretical stuff <laughs> is indeed your question. What, what constitutes just punishment? I'm not sure that one can give a general answer to that. Uh, uh, maybe you could say some. If there are generalities to be expressed about that, I can't give them to you right now. But there are a lot of punishments that are unjust. And what I said is this, this fourfold system or threefold system, system of laws and sanctions of, of judiciary to make judgments about violations and so forth and post punishment than the police to deter and so forth. How do we decide whether the punishments are unjust? I th so what I hinted at without ex actually saying it is from my newspaper knowledge of what happens in U.S. prisons and from discussions with people in my church who are actually involved in prisons, it's clear to me that a lot of what goes for punishment I think is aimed at demeaning the prisoners. It's just aimed at demeaning. A member of my congregation is in prison. He was converted in prison. He started a, house, a church in prison. The government just, the system just refuses to let him out. And I, and so far as I can see, their goal is just, let's demean them. Let's, we don't have it here. Lest your brother be degraded in your sight. I think they want to degrade him. And he's, refu <laughs> he's refusing to, to be degraded. But a, a general answer to your question, what constitutes just punishment, I don't know. Yes, Andrew? Yeah, I have two questions. One, as regards to the difference between the way the hospital is decentralized and grounded for rights, and then on the other hand, um, the way the United Nations does that. Do you think part of the complications there is the assumption that they make about um, the human being? Because it seems to me like Michael Sandel would argue, because he's a strong communitarian, and he would argue, he would argue that it's difficult to conceptualize the true human being outside the community. So the minimum unit of analysis should be the community. And if you start the community with the community, then focus on the infant or whatever becomes uh, kind of so because yes I'm here but I have a family or whatever so but if the minimum unit or the unit of analysis is just the individual then I think we run into problems there. And then the second question I have is uh, about the Christian grounding of uh, uh, rights by based on God's law for us. You see as an African or even people in Latin America or even the Americas they cannot talk about Christianity outside their historical context. And as Martin Buber I used in this I know if I remember very well, we experience God's love through our interaction with others. It's not just something really abstract out there, but 
if we experience that through interaction with others. But the, the way some of us have experienced God's love through his incarnation in this world, which is the church, has been really very terrible that it's difficult for me to arrive at a concept of uh, human rights, for instance, through the history of the church very easily. At least I begin to make a distinction between what kind of church or what kind of society or whatever. And even today, when you look at some of the language that is used by some evangelicals in the United States, it's almost like being a committed Christian draws me away from the love of other human beings because uh, it's like I'm a child of God and I'm entitled to everything, but all other people are bastard because they don't believe in God like me. And to me, that makes it very difficult for me to relate to another human being who is not a Christian. So, again, my concern there is how can I understand this love of God just as an individual? Is this like something in my DNA, or how do I come to understand that? Um, so, Samuel is raising the really important question of the role of communities in all this and various aspects of that. So it's true that the human rights declarations, I've not actually read through them with your question in mind. Uh, they dominantly focus on the rights of individuals. Well, they have cultural rights also. There's another section which is talking about cultural rights, which is... Yeah, right. In the later documents, there's a section on cultural rights. Um, so they're not... So here's my view. I think individuals have rights, but I also think that, let me just use a general term now, social entities of various sorts, organizations, groups, nations, peoples, and so forth. I think social entities also have rights. They can be wronged, and, so, and that shows that they can have rights. Um, so that are, is that a full, so that a full account of rights let me put it like this. I think the account of rights that I gave you, though I sort of had individuals in mind, is in fact, an, I meant it as an account that applies to everything whatsoever, that applies to social entities as well as to individuals. The UN doctor declarations, the initial ones anyway, certainly had their eyes primarily on individuals. And, and you can sort of see why. I mean, they've got Nazi Germany in mind, right? And Nazi Germany was, goodness knows, intensely communitarian. I mean, you know. <laughs> But the, but the community was such that it was profoundly abusing the individuals. So a community can be abused. Um, individuals within a community can be abused. And, and both of them are important. Yeah. And here's one more thing. Remember, I, I described rights as always a social engagement. It's, it's a way of being treated. It's, it's, it's never just me. It's 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 me and you, or me and me and us. It's um, or you and us. So I think so. Uh, if you don't understand rights as autonomy, as I do not, but if you understand them as being treated in a way that befits my dignity, that's a much less individualistic way of thinking about rights than the classic autonomy approach. So that goes some ways forward. Answering your question. Yeah, Joe? Um, I had a question about audience with this waking people up stuff, which I think is right. But to take the prison example, if you know, if you go into COS, our church, and say we need to wake up to the problem of prison, that's news. If you go into another church in Grand Rapids and say, hey, the prison system is broken, and everyone says, well, yeah, we knew that already. We, we've known that for years because they have people within the prison system in their families and stuff. So what the, the prophet's audience, and then this, this dual role, is the, the part of the role that focuses on visioning a better reality. Do you think that's specifically targeted or not? So the wake up to the injustice is maybe targeted at the powerful, is that, hey, there's actually the possibility of a better reality? Uh, is that targeted towards the other half of this dynamic in, in, in your hands? So let's see, uh, the, the prophets, I said, have as their tar target the powerful. In your and my society, which is a democratic society, a prophet is going to do, Martin Luther King did more than speak to the powerful. He spoke to the people. 
in a democratic society, it's, you and I have deep responsibility for how the government goes. And the, uh, I mean, the prophets are talking about a monarchy in which uh, a monarchy and a court. So our target is is for our target for waking up in a democratic society. Those who have to be wa awakened are not just governmental officials, but the people in general. And you wake and. Part of the awakening has to be enabling them to imagine an alternative because often often the reason that the practices are entrenched is people can't, e either people cannot imagine an alternative or the alternative is too frightening. Mm -hmm. So again, what Martin Luther King did is enable people to imagine an alternative and, and gradually calm people's fears is it wouldn't, it wouldn't be destructive. North American built U.S. society, but, I, but but we're in agreement that the awakening, I think, has to be a crucial and is an indispensable part of it, and that's what the prophets are great at. They're they're trying to wake wake people up. In their case, the powerful. In your case, civil society generally. I mean, the people. This should be our last question. Okay. Thank you. How do you explain the rather or apparent? absence of condemnation in the New Testament of the Roman Empire. They suffered persecution, they suffered unfair taxes, and it seems that every time they go in that direction, then they talk about heaven. So many Christians, when they are confronted by injustice today, they say, let's focus our energy in sending people to heaven. And it, it seems that what is so clear in the Old Testament doesn't show, apart from Jesus, even though he never as far as I can remember, he never condemned the Roman Empire per se. But everything else written in the New Testament, and maybe I just have to buy a uh, reading that is too biased, but it really seems that they avoided confronting the structures of their, uh, their current reality and by focusing a lot on the perfect kingdom to come. So the book of Revelation is really not that way. I mean, in Revelation 13, it's pretty clear Rome, Alan Musa thinks of Diocletian, and Rome is described as the great beast, the great devouring beast, and that's, that's Isaiah language, <laughs> right? Um, secondly, the Pauline letters are letters to struggling young churches, giving them advice as to how to live. Um, they're not, I, Isaiah can address the court, the, uh, I mean, the, the Israelite court, the monarch, and so forth. Uh, what would it have been like? I mean, the option wasn't available for Paul to address the emperor. So he's giving advice to his, these struggling young communities. But the critique is implicit, and in Revelation it's very explicit. But it's true. Um, I can't read your passages quite like from the New Testament, quite like the ones I read from Isaiah. That's true. Okay. okay. Thank you, Nick. One quick again.